What the fuck? Anthony Michael Bourdain burst onto the culinary culture scene with a bang with his 2000 New York Times bestseller, Kitchen Confidential, Adventures in the Culinary Underbelly. And he's been a staple in the hearts and minds of amateur chefs ever since. Never one to bite his tongue, he quickly parlayed his celebrity status into a food and world travel television series, A Cook's Tour. I, just, I, I wrote an obnoxious book and... Um and that somehow turned into a TV show. And from then on, he's been a cultural staple, commenting on everything from the comestible, like Korean fried chicken, to the hard to digest, like hashtag me too. His silver tongue has been known to prick more than just the food industry enthusiast and insider. You silver tongue devil, you. Bourdain does not eat his words. He is outspoken, upfront, and unafraid to let those he thinks are in the wrong feel the burn. Yeah, I, I hope I haven't frightened anyone away. So, we've got for you a list of the top 10 times Anthony Bourdain insulted a celebrity. Pinhead. Anthony Bourdain and Ina Garten. Ina Rosenberg Garten started her career at the White House Office of Management and Budget, but having friends like Ellie Zabar and Martha Stewart helped her radically change directions. In 1978, an ad in the local paper advertising a 400 square foot specialty food store changed her life. She quit her government job and bought the place. What followed was a series of successes, from store expansion to book sales, to appearances on Martha Stewart's television show, all of which culminated into her very own Food Network series, Barefoot Contessa. When asked about his Food Network compatriot, Mr. Bourdain told interviewers she was very bizarre. What? He's quoted as saying, I don't want to stay at her house. I think her friends are creepy. This is all just because of a sandwich. I don't want to spend a weekend there. It gets weird in Ina land. And when he was asked to describe the writing method behind his second book, Appetites, a cookbook, he said, I morphed into a psychotic, anally retentive, bad-tempered Ina Garten. This is Christmas. We aren't quite sure what that means, but it can't be a good thing. In the end, Borden and Garten eventually buried the hatchet. When asked by Refinery29 what he thought of the author and host, he said, I'll make a little fun of her now and then. <laughs> it's very perfect in Ina world, scarily so. But then added, what she cooks on TV is legit and instructive. If you do as Ina does, chances are you're going to get a good product. I got real respect for her. He told Atlanta Magazine, when Ina Garten roasts a chicken, she roasts it correct. When Ina Garten makes mashed potatoes, those are some solid mashed potatoes. He is quoted as saying she is one of the only people on the Food Network who can actually cook. Though this statement doesn't say much for the Food Network, it is the highest of compliments coming from the harshest of critics. It stinks. The relationship between Ina Garten and Anthony Bourdain may have gotten off to a rocky start, but it would seem the two have made amends and will develop good relations in the future. I can't believe this has happened. I can't. Speaking of good relations, why not be a bit more buddy-buddy with us? Hit that subscribe button and click that notification bell. Bourdain versus Adam Richman. Between 2008 and 2012, the Travel Channel's Man vs. Food was a ratings juggernaut that turned a then little-known actor and author by the name of Adam Richman into a minor celebrity. The concept was basic. Richmond discovers the local foods in different cities across America, all while visiting local landmarks. And to top it off, he'd enter some kind of food competition where he'd compete to eat the most whatever in as little time as possible. How about a nice, greasy pork sandwich served in a dirty ashtray? His celebrity status soon got him in the crosshairs of Anthony Bourdain, who made minced meat of Richmond and Man vs. Food in his stand-up routine. Why did we watch the show? Admit it, you wanted him to die. Harsh words, right? Well, Bourdain was unafraid to up the ante. Hit me. He then claims the show is popular in Afghanistan, Yemen, Libya, and Iran, stating, The show confirms their worst suspicions, that Americans are fat, lazy, slothful, and wasteful. And imagining a goat herder in Afghanistan he said, I know what he's thinking. America is a terrible place. I want to join ISIS. Tomorrow, I bomb it. <laughs> Yikes. Richmond tried to take it all in stride, though. He claimed in an interview with Observer.com that Tony is actually a friend of mine and I talked to him about it. I was like, you threw me under the bus. You can just drop f***ing dead. 
I understand the need for a good line, but I hope that his want of a good friend is greater than that. And he made it clear that it was. I'm gonna use the cushion. Yeah. <laughs> Anthony Bourdain against the Food Network. Though the Food Network is arguably what introduced the wider world to Bourdain, Anthony has, in the years since the debut of his first hit television series, A Cook's Tour, shown signs of having very little love for the brand and its members. Bourdain claims that in 2007, the network took a calculated break with the idea of the celebrity chef as a seasoned professional and a move toward an entirely new definition, a personality with a saute pan. Bourdain was not through panning the network for its lack of substance and pandering to celebrity culture. In fact, that was just the beginning. He defines the network as a programming outrage and defines its modern lineup as a sad and pandering example of rehashed leftovers. The humiliating, painful to watch Food Network Awards, the clumsily rigged looking Next Food Network star, the cheesily cheap jack production values of Next Iron Chef America, every obviously half assed knockoff they slapped on the air would go on to ring up sky high ratings and an ever larger audience of cherished males 22 to 36, or whatever that prime car buying demographic is. See, where's my car? Where's your car, dude? It would seem Bourdain is just as disappointed in a network that would choose to invest in these retreads as he is in a world that would elevate such malarkey to a successful status. Such things, rightly or wrongly, send me into a a spiral of misery and depression that lasted three days. He said, The eye searing Kwanzaa cake clip on YouTube of Sandra Lee doing things with store bought angel food cake, canned frosting, and corn nuts, instead of simply being the unintentionally hilarious viral video it should be, makes me mad for all humanity. Now for the icing. I just can't help it. And just to make it clear that the network puts no value in its own representation. I've even been called Macaroni Monet. Bourdain had this to say about the Food Network Awards. The production itself, above and beyond the witless, ill-considered, just plain stupid concept of an awards show, where most of the awards went to the inanimate objects. Accepting the award for best comfort food is macaroni and cheese. A round of applause for this inanimate carbon rod. Appliances or cities, Portland's mayor wisely did not bother to show. The production values were lower than whale shit. And that, dear friends, is how you burn a food network. <laughs> burn! <laughs> Bourdain and Alice Waters. Alice Waters is a chef, activist, and author whose hard work is helping to bring the United States towards a healthy, fresh, non-industrial, and self-sustained, small-scale vision of food and farming. Her stance against the fast food nation and cookie-cutter TV dinners has been commended by the likes of the Obamas. And her attempts, which began in 1996 at reforming American lunches in schools across the nation, along with her battle against the USDA's corporate squelching of all things healthy, in service of private bottom lines, are going on on to this day. Her accomplishments are myriad, and her influence on America is evidenced in our relationship with food to this very day. So it came as a disappointment to many fans when Anthony Bourdain decided to take the public cleaver to her and stating, Alice Waters annoys the living shit out of me. We're all in the middle of a recession, like we're all going to start buying expensive organic food and running to the green market. There's something very Khmer Rouge about Alice Waters that has become unrealistic. I'm suspicious of orthodoxy, the kind of orthodoxy when it comes to what you put in your mouth. It was a disappointment, but it was no surprise. Now, whether it was the sense of ensuing public backlash or actual remorse from having pointed his critical finger in an undeserving direction, Bourdain did try to explain a little further and what many consider the closest thing to a backpedal we're likely to ever see from him. I don't have any burning issue with Alice Waters, a restaurateur and a visionary whose accomplishments clearly dwarf my own. In a perfect, candy-colored world, I'd like to eat most of what she'd like to see us eat. I feed my daughter mostly organic food whenever possible. My thoughts were a heartfelt reaction to her wildly hubristic letter to the then-president-elect, a document whose tone, timing, and content I found distasteful, particularly coming from someone who hadn't even bothered to vote in the four previous elections. Chez Panisse was inarguably a cradle of the food revolution. I respect Alice Waters' enormous contribution to changing the way we eat and cook today. No one can take that away from her. No one should try. But fear not, Bourdain purists, because if that felt a bit too 
too close to an apology, he offered a follow-up comment to wash down the taste of such a glowing elegy. She says some stupid shit sometimes, and she is certainly free to call bullshit on me when I do the same. So there you have it, kind words with a soupçon of bite. Anthony Bourdain and Wolfgang Puck Wolfgang Puck has been present in the hearts and minds of Hollywood, the Glitterati, and their legions of followers since the early 1980s. One could argue that as a spiritual descendant of Julia Child, who first put cooking in the minds of every house of America, Puck is the man most responsible for ushering in the modern era of the celebrity chef. Madonna came with Michael Jackson, Tom with Nicole. The spotlight turned Wolfgang into a global brand. Bake your little cobblers in there. In fact, some might say he's the original celebrity chef. Bourdain, however, though a child of history, is more known for being a stubborn child than a reverent one. Damn you, vile woman! You've impeded my work since the day I escaped from your wretched womb. Bourdain told Playboy magazine, Listen, I'm not eating in his shitty pizza restaurants. I think it's bullshit, and it breaks my heart to see him on QVC or whatever. You broke my heart. But the fact is, he paid his dues. He's an important guy. It's an Orson Welles thing. He made Citizen Kane, so it doesn't matter what he does after that. Upon hearing this, Puck replied, But does he have a successful restaurant? And there you have it. Two masters in their respective fields, observing each other from a distance with respect, while both disappointed in the other's ultimate accomplishments. I am so sad. I am so very, very sad. Bourdain versus Guy Fieri we all know Guy Fieri as a loudmouth, frosted tip, all American badass with a round belly, loud clothes, and a goatee. Now, what are you gonna get? You're gonna get big, bold taste and some funky flavors. So it's therefore of no shock to anybody that a guy like Guy might rub Anthony Bourdain the wrong way. In 2015, Bourdain said, I sort of feel in a heartfelt way for Guy. I wonder about him. He's 52 years old and still rolling around in a flame outfit. What does he do? How does Guy Fieri de-douche? But it's apparently all love from Bourdain's perspective. I have no hate in my heart for the guy. He doesn't make me angry. He's just low-hanging fruit. He's a rich and deep source of comedy. If one squints a little, with words like deep and rich, this could almost be seen as a compliment. When Fieri opened his American kitchen and bar in Times Square, Bourdain told interviewers he single-handedly turned the neighborhood into the Ed Hardy district, which I'm a little pissed off about. The two have yet to host a Food Network Awards show together. Together. Bourdain and the left, especially Bill Maher. Having elevated his status from that of a chef to that of a public persona, Bourdain's disdain occasionally reaches far beyond the realm of sustenance and its connoisseurs. When Trump was elected, he blamed the very people he considers his peers. He once told Reason, the utter contempt with which privileged Eastern liberals such as myself discuss red state, gun country, working class America as ridiculous and morons and rubes is largely responsible for the upswell of rage and contempt and desire to pull down the temple that we're seeing now. He then singled out Bill Maher as the worst of the smug, self-congratulatory left. He's a classic example of the smirking, contemptuous, privileged guy who lives in a bubble. All right, I'm awesome. Let's get on with the show. <laughs> and he is in no way looking to reach outside or even look outside of that bubble in an empathetic way. Preaching to the converted doesn't change anyone's opinions. It only solidifies them and makes things worse for all of us. Say what you want about Bourdain, but one thing is certain, the man knows how to tend an olive branch, and that's with a twist. Anthony Bourdain and Paula Dean. The feud between Anthony Bourdain and Paula Dean is now legendary and extremely well known. Many pinpoint its beginning to the time he told TV Guy that she revels in unholy connections with evil corporations and she's proud of the fact that her food is bad for you. I swear, Monty, you are the devil himself. I, who told you? <laughs> yes. Plus, her food sucks. He's once called her the worst, most dangerous person to America. No way! And he's even gone as far as saying she was proud of the fact that her food is effing bad for you. I ate his liver with some fava beans. After Dean revealed she had type 2 diabetes, Bourdain took to Twitter saying, thinking of getting into the leg-breaking business so I can profitably sell crutches later. Bourdain claims Dean's brand is excess without guilt, and for her to turn around and roll out a $500 diabetes treatment after basically endorsing a lifestyle that would worsen these people's conditions is in excruciatingly bad taste. It's unconscionable, cynical, and greedy. 
$30 million a year. How much money do you need? To this day, these two have yet to send each other birthday cards. Bourdain and Alec Baldwin. Feeling confident in his position as a cultural announcer and spokesperson of modern thought, oh, shit. Bourdain even let fellow leftist artist Alec Baldwin get a taste of his patented brand zing. It's showtime. When asked what advice he would give Alec Baldwin about his stance on the Me Too movement, he told the Daily Beast he would tell the famed actor to just shut up. He later tweeted Baldwin saying, you really are too dumb to pour piss out of a boot. If the boot fits. And accused Baldwin further, saying he was either a complete moron or providing cover for your pals and saving your own rep. Maybe all three. Considering it was Baldwin's silence after hearing allegations of Harvey Weinstein's sexual misconduct with Charmed star Rose McGowan, one might think that perhaps people shutting up is what leads to this mess in the first place. After all, it was the little-known Reverend Charles F. Akid who once said, For evil men to accomplish their purpose, it is only necessary that good men do nothing. You go ahead and read your Bible, Dennis. Anthony Bourdain and Donald Trump. When asked by the brilliant minds behind TMZ what Bourdain would serve if he was catering a summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un, Bourdain answered hemlock, which is a poison once used as an execution method. As host of a food and travel show, Bourdain has seen a lot of countries, and as a local New Yorker, he has seen a lot of Trump. <laughs> and his opinion of the commander-in-chief is informed by these two divergent sides of himself. Beer. That's how we get respect. Show them all that we do things. He feels that, to Trump, nobody that isn't male, white, and wealthy counts. We're just hearing what he thinks. But it's the astonishing lack of curiosity, the astonishing laziness. I have to travel this world where everybody is laughing at us. It's one thing to be hated, it's another thing to be feared. But to be ridiculed everywhere and treated as pathetic? <laughs> But the insults don't stop there. He has no interest in talking to anybody. He talks about himself, and that is the only subject which is of any interest to him. It's a level of discourse so submoronic that it was unthinkable at any other point in my life. It's just me, myself, and I. And I. You know he hasn't eaten at a single restaurant in Washington, D.C. other than at a steakhouse in his own hotel since he took the presidency? Just what he eats is already damning. He's told interviewers, I find him personally objectionable. In case you were wondering if these opinions are simply made up to fit a leftist agenda, here's what Bourdain had to say. I'm a New Yorker. Donald Trump is a New Yorker. And the New Yorkers I know, we've lived with this guy for 30 years. I've seen Donald Trump say things one day, and then I saw what he did the next. I've seen up close how he does business. Just like if you lived in a small town, you'd get to know the sheriff, the guy who runs the hardware store, the guy who runs the filling station. Trump comes from that era of guys you followed, guys you knew about every day. Trump, Giuliani, Al Sharpton. I'd see him at Studio 54 for F's sake. I'm not saying I know the guy personally, not like I'd hug him, but I'm saying that as a New Yorker, we pretty much are neighbors. You called about your neighbors? No. We have call ID. The cops. And my many years of living in his orbit have not left me with a favorable impression. Let's put it that way. There are so many reasons to find the guy troubling. When Scott Bayo's the only guy you can find to show up at your convention, you're in trouble. And in another interview, he finished that thought perfectly. You are probably the stupidest person in the room. He eats his steak well done. I think that really settles it. And yes, it does seem that a well done steak with a side of ketchup is Trump's favorite meal. When it comes to great steaks, I've just raised the stakes. We're not about to start any feuds with you, so why not click that subscribe button and hit that notification bell? And check out some of our other videos while you're here. The world is filled with people doing the best they can, you know?